Our last method that we're going to look at is observational research, corresponding with section 32 in the chapter we're reading. So observational research is studies in which some particular behavior is systematically observed and studied. <laughs> so the goal is to understand a characteristic behavior of an individual group or setting. It's non-experimental, there's no independent variable, nothing is manipulated, and no causal conclusions can be drawn. We'll talk about five, times of, five types of observational research, naturalistic observation, participant observation, structured observation, case studies, and archival research. First, naturalistic observation. So it, we are simply in this type of study observing behavior in the environment in which it occurs. So Jane Goodall, for example, studied chimpanzees by watching them in the natural environment in East Africa. Today, um, observing children's recess behaviors to learn about play patterns and group formations um, is an example that we used in our class and a study that you looked at early in this unit. And so you can see um, some examples here. I'm not going to read a lot of this. You can read it yourself. So just pause here and read what they did and you'll see exactly how this observational design was used. There are some problems with naturalistic observation. The first is called the Hawthorne effect. Um, it's uh, because it's referring to the observer impacting what is being observed. So imagine that someone was coming into your home to observe your family would you change your family's behavior because there's an observer there? And this was originally found in researchers who were studying the impact of lighting on an employee productivity. So they came in to watch the employees work and they found that the work improved just because they were being watched. It didn't have to do with being um, the lighting or they couldn't tease those effects apart. And you can see here, if you were doing a playground study that these children are aware of you, the researcher, and might they change their behavior because you're there. So to counter that, we often use disguised observation so that the observed do not realize they're being watched. And so um, hiding, staying, staying back or just uh, being quiet, not letting it be known, let, not letting your presence be felt. And in part that can happen just by being there for a long time. People get used to you. We might ask, are there ethical violations if you're disguising yourself and watching people? And generally, the IRB will approve this. It's not considered to be a violation as long as the observation occurs in a setting where participants would not expect to have privacy, like a public setting. But if they expect to have privacy, like a hotel room or something like that, then that would be a, a violation and a questionable study. Our second type is participant observation. So in participant observation, researchers become active participants in the group or situation they're studying. It might, the reason for this is that you might not be able to really get information unless you're part of the group, especially if you're studying like a subversive group, some sort of rebels or people who might be violent or a gang. You might have to participate in the group to really understand it. An example your book describes by Festinger who is a famous researcher in cognitive dissonance, they really study that he did looked at how cult members and cult members are people who are like brainwashed to believe a certain thing and maybe even give all their money away and live with the group. They're, they're just really taken in by the teachings of the group. And how would they respond to the failure of an end of world prediction? It was to occur December 21, 1954. Festinger thought, no way this is going to happen. And so he, disguised himself, joined the cult to see how they would handle it when the world didn't end on this day. And he found out that after that day passed, members persisted in their beliefs. In fact, they told themselves that it was their faith and prayers that saved the world. And so he really did gain quite an understanding that led to his whole theory of cognitive dissonance. So as mentioned, there are two types of participant observation. One is undisguised participant observation in which the researchers tell who they are and disclose their identity to the group. And that's more ethical. There's no deception and informed consent can be attained. But of course, 
participants might not act naturally. They might hide things from you. And so you might not get as much information about the topic. Disguised participant observation in which researchers conceal their identities has more ethical problems, but the data are more authentic. And there is a risk that the researcher who's participating in the group might lose objectivity, like they might get caught in by the group themselves. Um, and so that's the risk of bias. The data might be compromised because of these relationships formed with participants. And another thing to think about is the researchers might influence the group. Like if you're participating in the group, you're engaging with them and, and your influence could be felt and uh, it could influence what things happen. Another interesting example, Rosenhan in 1973 sent 12 people to pretend to be insane. And you looked at this in the video earlier. So this is the one where they pretended to be in a mental hospital. So all 12 were placed in the mental hospital and when they tried to get out on the basis that they were not pretending, they were not believed. It was hard for them to get out again. Structured observation. So you also saw some films with structured observation at the start of this module. The researcher makes systematic observations of one or more specific behaviors in a particular setting that's controlled in some way. It might be a lab or a contrived environment, or it might be a natural setting where there's something that's occurring. Um, the data are more limited than in naturalistic observation because usually you're in this kind of study, you're looking for a particular behavior. So you're watching for certain things and you've probably spent a lot of time learning how to code the behaviors. The data might be gathered in numbers representing intensity or frequency. So there we have a quantitative component and the focus is usually more narrow than other observational studies. Here's an example. Um, this is a study that's called the pace of life in 31 countries. This study compared the pace of life in large cities from 31 countries across the world. The indicators of pace of life, three indicators of pace of life were observed. Average walking speed in downtown locations, the speed with which postal clerks completed a simple request, work speed, and the accuracy of public clocks. So they were observing, but they were observing certain things. Overall, pace of life was fastest in Japan and the countries of Western Europe and slowest in economically undeveloped countries, faster in colder climates, in economically productive countries and in individualist cultures like the US. Faster places also tended to have higher rates of death from coronary heart disease, higher smoking rates and greater subjective well-being. People felt good, but their outcomes aren't that good necessarily in terms of heart disease and smoking. Um, so um, it's structured because they're looking only for certain things that are indicative of pace of life. Another example, insult, aggression, and the Southern culture of honor, an experimental ethnography. Three experiments examined how norms characteristic of a culture of honor manifest themselves in cognitions, behaviors, and reactions of Southern white males. Participants were University of Michigan students who grew up in the North or South. In three experiments, they were insulted by a Confederate who bumped into the participant and called him an asshole. Compared with Northerners who were relatively uninfected by the insult, Southerners were more likely to think their masculine reputation was more threatened, more upset, more physiologically primed, more primed for aggression, and more likely to engage in aggressive and dominant behavior. Now, two times they mentioned the word experiment. You'll have to read on, but question, is this really an experiment? Because something has to be manipulated and participants have to be randomly assigned. And in this case, it sounds from this this abstract that they're comparing northerners and southerners but they're doing the same thing to everyone someone's bumping into them and calling him a name and they're just looking at responses so we'll question is it just that the abstract doesn't tell us enough or is it that the word experiment is inc incorrectly used 
So the nuances of structured observations uh, first relate to coding. Research assistants must learn to code behaviors. Like in the last study, what counts as aggressive? What counts as defensive? If I watch it, am I going to say it's aggressive and you will say it's not aggressive? And so there's a lot of training needed to ensure consistency. And there's still questions whether the coded behaviors actually reflect the underlying emotion. We need to establish inter-rater reliability, making sure that researchers are coding behaviors consistently. Everyone must code the behaviors in the same way. And then the benefits and downside, there's a narrowed focus which reduces time and expense. Wait time is eliminated since researchers structure the environment so we don't have to wait. We don't have to just sit in the hallway and wait for someone to bump into somebody because we controlled the environment. But of course, the more we control it, the less external validity we have. Archival studies are our next topic. Method four is archival research, which is simply an archive is a collection of historical records about a person or group of people. And so you can go back and get, oh, immigration records from way back, or you can get prison records or um, tax records or health records. And so an archive is these old records that can be used for research. And archival researchers review these records to look at history, patterns, anomalies, trends. And these could be qualitative if they're looking at, again, as I said, old diaries, or it could be quantitative if they're looking at, say, data from twin studies from way back. And so these are all the types of records that could be obtained. So that's the fourth type of research in the descriptive way. And all of these are descriptive that I've just described to you now. So in this particular study by Palam and colleagues, um, the researchers for, start by saying, why Susie sells seashells by the seashore? You'll notice all the S's in this little tongue twister. But then the study, implicit egotism and major life decisions. And this is kind of an interesting study of archives. So they're interested in, they state most people prefer things that are connected to the self. So that's egotism. So for example, the letters in one's name, we prefer the letters that are in our own name. And there's a lot of evidence behind this. And they call this implicit egotism. And so they were just wondering if this egotism actually influences major life decisions, where people choose to live and what they choose to do for a living. And so um, using archival data, I'll show you this in a moment, they found that people are in fact disproportionately likely to live in places whose names resemble their own first or last name. Like people named Lewis are disproportionately likely to live in St. Louis. And the last study, they extended this to birthday number preferences. People were disproportionately likely to live in cities whose names began with their birthday numbers, like Two Harbors, Minnesota, if their birthday's on the second. Um, and then they choose careers whose labels resemble their names, like people named Dennis or Denise are overrepresented among dentists. This seems to be a type of implicit egotism and contrasts with models of rational choice. So this is a funny little study and let's look at how they did it. This is where the archival part comes in. In study one, we first identified the 40 largest cities in the United States. We then consulted the 1990 census to identify all of the common male and female names that shared a minimum of their first three letters with any of these city names. Because the popularity of different first names varied with age, we selected two qualifying European American female names that we could match most closely for age. We then repeated this to provide the same male names. And so they had combinations like Mildred, Milwaukee, Virginia, and Virginia Beach. For men, Jack Jacksonville and Philip in Philadelphia. To combine the data for study one, then they describe the statistical techniques. But the point here is what they're using is the records, the 1990 census data. So this is an archival study. They didn't gather any new data. They used existing data. Case studies is our last type of design. So a case study is really broad. It's an in-depth examination of an individual, social unit, or event. So usually this is qualitative, relying on verbal data, 
It might, it's very in-depth and often longitudinal, may or may not involve observations in a natural setting. It may incorporate quantitative analysis, but only those needed to understand the subject. And it, the, the, what you can take out of this little image is that they're looking at a lot of different aspects of their chosen subject to do their case study. So one that your book mentions, a very famous one, is the case study of one man, H.M. And the reason he is famous is because he had many, many seizures, so bad that he couldn't really function. They were debilitating and preventing him from living his life. And so they did a brain surgery to remove the parts of the brain from which the seizures were emanating, and specifically his hippocampus and amygdala. And so they got the result. The seizures decreased, but the undesired result is that he could no longer form new memories. That's called anti-rograde amnesia. Or he also couldn't remember the previous 11 years of his life, retrograde amnesia. And so his study became a valuable contribution to psychology. We could learn a lot about the different brain parts by what happened to him after his surgery. Some more examples of case studies have more participants. This first, these are all books that I've read, and they're all case studies. Um, promises I can keep. I would call these case studies a series of case studies. In this case, in this situation, they were interested in why poor mother, why poor women put motherhood before marriage. What's going on here? So they were interested in that phenomenon, and they went deeply through interviews and spending time with these women to understand how their life choices were made. The second book by Jonathan Kozel is called Savage Inequalities, Children in America's Schools. And in this book, the cases were not people. People were part of the cases, but the cases were schools. And so he went to, for example, um, one place he went to is Chicago, where within a mile of each other, you could have the poorest schools in the city, and then one mile out, you can have the richest. And so he spent a lot of time in those schools, um, those two schools and a number of other pairs of schools or different types of schools to see what's different in these experiences and how are these inequalities playing out for children in our poorest schools. So the cases were schools and of course there were many human participants in the cases. Finally, unequal childhood gets at a question I made earlier in this lecture. Um, in this case, they were interested in what happens, what are differences between poor and more affluent families, like what things are happening in the home. And so this researcher had her students, um, each student was assigned to a family and they had coding techniques in mind. They knew what they were looking for. They were taking notes. And of course, the families agreed to this, but they spent enough time with the family that the families started to behave in a natural way. And so they would just hang out in these homes and take data and find out what is life like in like a more affluent or, or even a middle class home compared to what is the lived experience at home of children in these poor neighborhoods. So all three of these are, I guess I'm on a common theme here um, for whatever reason, because there are lots of case studies that don't relate to inequality. I think these are just three books that I had read at the time I made this slide, and so those came to my mind most quickly. So the pros and cons of case studies. The pros are you get a lot of detail and analysis, and you have really good insight and even theoretical foundations from your analysis. You have improved understanding for future studies. You can study rare conditions, like um, if you wanted to, like HM. That's a rare condition, and that in-depth study allowed that. We couldn't get a whole big sample. The cons are that they can't provide evidence for theories because they're just you know, one or just a few cases. There are problems with internal and external validity. There might be alternative explorations for what's been going on. And there might be bias due to the relationship of the researcher to the subject. Like once you start to, you can't keep your heart out of it, and so then as soon as that's in place, you, it's easy to become biased. Um, so you have there our ending of this content, and um, hopefully you feel familiar with these many different types of studies.